Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I am Vicki Harp, and this is my uh, colleague, Yudisha Gautam. And we are uh, on the SQL Server Tools team. And we're here today to talk to you about the future of the SQL Server Tools and the present of the SQL Server Tools. So when I'm talking about SQL Server Tools, I'm talking about kind of a stack of experiences that goes from the SQL Server engine up to your graphical interfaces in the SQL portal. So that the lowest level, that's the SQL Server drivers, that's ODBC, that's .NET client, that's things like that, programmability interfaces. Up from that, we have APIs like DACFX, SMO, uh, SQL Management Objects, PowerShell, scripting, things like that. So that's another layer of experiences. Above that, we have command line tools. That's SQL CMD, BCP, MS SQL CLI, things of that sort. Above that, we have the GUI tools, which would be SSMS, uh, Visual Studio Projects uh, support for SQL Server, uh, VS Code, Azure Data Studio, and then the Azure portal itself. So everything I just mentioned, that's what I'm classifying as the SQL Server tools. Reporting services, the BI tools, things of that sort, are not actually in this group. And it's not that they're not, they don't have a team, but that's not my team, that's not our team, so that's not what we're here to talk about. So I thank you all for coming. I, who here has been to SQL Pass before? All right, who here is their first SQL Pass? Awesome, well thank you so much for coming. Thank you for making me your first general session for newcomers and for those who have been here before alike. Um, so this is a session about futures. This is a session about things that haven't been released. So we're not going to have any photography of slides in this one, but it's not for the reason you think, it's because I do not have any slides. So this is a 100% demo uh, presentation, and we're excited to share this all with you. Everything we're sharing is public. You can talk about it, you can share it, you can blog about it, and you can, and more importantly, give us feedback, because it's important for us to know if what we're working on in the future is what you need to do your job. So I want to start can we turn up my mic a little bit? I'm getting some requests for that. So we're going to start our session on the future of SQL Server toolings. Let's make sure that this is going to hook up with the past. So does anybody recognize this? This is SQL Server 2014. This is five years ago, right? And this is where we were on SQL Server tooling. So I want to remind you what we would do. So we'd go over here to installation. This is the ISO installer for those of you who don't recognize it. And then look here, we go to tools and it's just, there's a sysconfig checker, there's things like that. Where, where are the tools though? Where, how do we get to the tools? So I'll, I'll cut ahead to it. You have to go to new SQL Server standalone installation. Now let's wait while this goes and let's think about this. So for I guess the first 20 years of SQL Server, in order to get the tools for SQL Server, you had to install SQL Server. So this is a backwards relationship. So let's go through this. We hit, I want a free edition. Let's accept the license terms. Let's let it run a prereq check. And then a scan for product updates. I'm not installing SQL Server, but it is scanning to see if there's any newer version of a service pack of SQL Server while I'm trying to install my tools. So then I do firewall. Go through that, SQL Server feature installation, scroll down here, and there they are, the management tools. So that's where we were five years ago. And so in SQL Server 2016, the decision was made to break this connection. And so since SQL Server 2016, the tools have been outside the box. That's what we call it. So you independently download your tools from Microsoft.com rather than downloading the SQL Server ISO just in order to install the tools. This has led to an interesting phenomenon, however, because as we have been innovating on tools and as we've been moving quickly on tools, there's not this sin single spot where with SQL Server 2019, you can go to the ISO, you can hit download, you can hit install, and you can see the brand new tools. It is now incumbent on you to know to go download the newest tools and see the newest experiences. This is something that we need to solve to make it easier to discover these tools. But with the announcement of SQL Server 2019, it's a great opportunity for you to see where we are and where we're headed in the tools. So, who here is familiar with Azure Data Studio? Okay, and who here is familiar with SSMS? 
Okay, great. So I'm going to answer this question right away. I'm going to quit setup. So is SSMS going away? No, no, SSMS is not going away. SSMS has 15 years of something like 80 developers per year, man hours of effort has gone into SSMS. SSMS is not a tool that we're going to be getting rid of. However, SSMS is based on the Visual Studio shell. It is 32-bit and it is Windows only. Since SQL Server 2017, Microsoft is now a multi-OS uh, operating system database system. We also have cloud, we have multi-cloud, we have hybrid, as you saw with Azure Arc. And so in order to move in that direction, we and the SQL Server tools are taking the same uh, motion as Visual Studio. Visual Studio has come out with Visual Studio Code. In the SQL Server tools, we've come up with Azure Data Studio, which is based on Visual Studio Code. It is cross-platform, multi-OS, multi-relational database system, because it supports other systems besides SQL. It's for hybrid environments, it's for cloud environments, and it's for on-prem environments. However, to get the most out of Azure Data Studio, you need to think of it as a different tool. Just like if you were using Visual Studio and you're used to all of the Visual Studio flows and you went directly into VS Code and said, what's all this scripting? Why is this all scripting? Why do I have to install inst extensions? It's a different mindset. So Azure Data Studio is a different mindset and it's one that we hope that you will find helpful. So one of the things that's really important about Azure Data Studio is the speed with which we are able to work. This is a truly agile product. We do uh, updates every month. We ship it every month. And if once you install it, you're going to get those shipments automatically. So if you haven't taken a look at Azure Data Studio since I last presented it at PASS last year, I want to show you what you've missed out on. These are all the commits that have been made to master on Azure Data Studio in the last year. My colleague here is actually responsible for 55 of those. Um, and so this is all the updates. So these are all uh, pull requests. Who in the audience here has made a pull request to Azure Data Studio? All right, we've got a couple people. And you know what? Not all of you are Microsoft employees. This is an open source product. This is something that you as users can make changes to, make updates to, make requests on. And so one of the things that I really want to get through here is that this tool is for you. We are here to serve you and to help you and for all of us to move together. When we're going into those keynotes and we're seeing Kubernetes and we're seeing Linux and we're seeing Docker and we're seeing hybrid environments, these are all incredible new technologies that you are having to learn to navigate. The, the thing is, your job isn't to navigate those technologies. Your job is to get the data to the business user. Your job is to make things secure. Your job is to make things uh, highly available. Your job isn't actually to learn these things that we've added unnecessary complexity to. So it is our job to reduce the complexity and to simplify it. So one of the big things that's different about Azure Data Studio and one of the things that I really want to spend some time on here is the concept of notebooks. So in the keynote, you probably saw a lot of people using notebooks. And let me show you a little bit of what that's all about. So who here has used uh, notebooks in Azure Data Studio? All right, you're in for a treat, those of you who haven't. So let me start with a query experience. So I'm going to connect to my, let's see, what am I connected to? Connect to my local hostess and select star from sys.databases. And I'm gonna make this bigger. I apologize, that is way too small. Sys.databases. So this is the traditional way in which we would run, here, I'm gonna make this uh, brighter for you. This is the traditional way in which you would run a query. So you run select star, and now I have the results set down at the bottom, and I have the query. If I hit control S, I get a .sql file, and if I wanna save this, I have a choice, CSV, I can do Excel, I can do JSON, I can do XML, but they are sep fundamentally separated concepts. And if I wanted to tell something about it, I could do it here in code. I could say list of databases as of 11.6, and that's kind of the state of the art of things, right? So I want to compare that experience to a notebook. So a SQL notebook is a, and actually any notebook, is a combination of human readable content and code along with the results. So let's do that same experience here in a notebook. So I'm gonna do 
using Markdown, which is some uh, kind of like a hyper you know, HTML adjacent language, I'll do list of databases as of 11.6. Now I'm gonna add some code. Say select star from sys.databases. And I'm gonna run that. And there's the results. And this is all in a single artifact. So whenever I file save as, or actually I'll just hit control S, and I'm gonna say databases. Now I go over here and let's say I'm gonna close this and I want to email this to a colleague and have them look at it. So I go over here and open databases again and I've got the full context of my comments, I've got what I, the code I ran and I've got the result sets all together. So this fundamental concept of a notebook is something that is really different about Azure Data Studio versus SSMS and something that as our users are, are playing with it, we're getting a lot of interesting new workflows out of it. We're hearing the ways that you're using it and we're hearing about what you need from it and we're iterating on it very quickly. Notebooks have been in Azure Data Studio for about a year now. SQL notebooks came out in March and then just this month we've added PowerShell as a supported language. So what do I mean by supported languages? So when you're dealing with a notebook, you've got this concept of kernels. So here I've got the SQL language, I've also got PySpark, Spark Scala, R, Python, and PowerShell. Whenever I change these out, it changes from one language to another, and then based on that language's concepts, I have an attached to. So you're probably pretty familiar with SQL. When you pick SQL, you also have to say, where is the SQL running? What server is it running on? So when you pick the SQL language, you're picking what SQL instance do I want it to run on? Whenever you're running Python, you're probably just picking the compute context. And so normally that's local. I'm saying, I want to run my Python code on this machine. If you're using Spark, you're using big data. So you're saying, what's my big data endpoint? Is it a SQL Server big data cluster, for example? And so that's the concept of the kernel and the attached to. But it, that's the only way in which it's, it's fundamentally very different from your typical experience of a query editor of saying, where do I run this? We've also got a other, couple other concepts here and I will explain them as we go. I see a question in the back. Okay, sure. So the question was, can I talk a little bit more about sharing? So an IPYMB file is the file format and it's a universal format for Jupyter Notebook. So that's something that you can share for Azure Data Studio, but you can also use it with other Jupyter viewers. So if you used Azure Notebooks, if you used uh, just a regular Jupyter, plain Jupyter, if you used one of the open source ones like uh, Interact, uh, it's the same file format and it will be able to be opened by it. Whether you'd be able to run it has to do with whether the same packages and everything are installed on that server. But uh, for the most part, it's even in GitHub, there's a viewer built into it. And so you can just email it. Security is just file ACLs. It's just like any other file. So we personally, you know, within Microsoft, we use Git repos and we treat it like source. But you could also put it in SharePoint, et cetera. But another question? Question is, will we be seeing analysis service stacks in uh, MDX? We do have a feature request for that, so go upvote it. And so we're, we're, we're waiting for it. I have a question over here. Okay, so the question is, whenever you pick a kernel, is that for the whole notebook or for, can you set for individual cells? You have hit upon our number one feature request. So, <laughs> it is for the entire notebook. However, there is, if you are really interested in this, please come and talk to me at the booth. There is a concept of a SQL magic or a magic, it doesn't have to be a SQL magic. A magic is a concept of something that you set at a per cell level to change what language it is. So you can say, I'm in Python, but for this cell, I want to be in SQL. But it's not as smooth an experience as we'd like it to be. We'd like it to have like drop downs. We'd really like it to be truly a multi-kernel experience where you could pick those things and maybe pick different connections. So we are definitely working on that right now. For the, for the present, you're gonna think about it being mostly one uh, connection and one language. So 
If someone shared it, can you open it in SSMS? No, this is a feature that's specifically for Azure Data Studio. However, in SSMS, you can hit open notebook and it will open Azure Data Studio for you in context. So you're able to move smoothly between those products because they're, they're kind of sister products, they're not really competitive products. And in the future, we're planning on making changes to the, kind of the packaging of the tools so that those are both available and you can easily kind of move between them. So let me go into something a little bit more, uh, I don't know, silly, uh, which is to say, I'm gonna show you a uh, Python notebook. So this is my random corgi. Somebody might, some of you might have seen this. I made this as a gist. Uh, and so this is just a little code I wrote and uh, just to kind of demonstrate, um, this is actually using a Monaco editor. So if I wanted to hit change all occurrences on this and say dog, image URL, you see how it changes both of those locations. So it's got a pretty rich code editing experience in here. But I'm gonna just run this, and what this does is it uses something called dog API to pull down an image of a corgi, just a random image of a corgi. So what we're gonna do, our really hard hitting business scenario here is we're gonna name this dog. And what better way to name a dog than with a SQL Server 2019 big data cluster, right? So let me show you what I've done. So, over here in my big data cluster, I have my HDFS node. I'm gonna scroll down here, and I've got license data. So here in this license data, I've got a bunch of uh, HDFS, and so let's take a look and preview that. Um, I've got a bunch of HDFS files that are the, all of the dog licenses from Allegheny County, Pennsylvania for the last you know, 10 years or so. And so we can see all that data in here, but this isn't the best way to explore it and understand it as a, as a user. So we've got, this view in Sandance option. So you saw this in the keynote. Sandance is a Microsoft Research visualization tool that we've added to uh, Azure Data Studio. So let me move this over to a tree map. And we're gonna say, I want to color by breed, and I'm gonna group it by breed. So here we can see what are the most common breeds kind of at a, at a glance. And the most common breed is kind of unsurprisingly mixed. So what's the next most common breed is going to be a Labrador. So I happen to know that, but I'm trying to mouse over this tiny thing. So it's a Labrador. So I'm gonna go over here in this list and find Labrador, and then I'm gonna hit isolate and say, let's just take a look at just our Labrador data set. And I'm going to say, let's color by dog name, or let's, actually, let's color by color, and let's group by color again. And see, what's the most common color of lab is black, followed by Let's see, yellow. So again, let's, let's isolate this down to black labs. And I'm going to say, let's color by dog name this time and group by dog name. And so here we get into you know, a lot of the long tail. People have a lot of different names for dogs, but we do have kind of a cluster up here and let's see what it is. The most common name for a black Labrador is shadow. So for my data set, I don't want to have these names that are more common to be more likely to be given to my little corgi than any other one. So I'm gonna do a little bit of code to find out what is the unique set of names and then I'm going to pick one at random. So let's say that I'm a data scientist and I'm familiar with uh, Python, I'm familiar with Spark, and I'd like to do this in Spark. So here I've got a big data cluster connection and actually in fact, if I had right clicked on that uh, file and hit analyze a notebook, it would give me this code. Now I'm gonna hit run cells and let it do its thing. So what it's going to do is it's going to look across that entire set of CSVs, not just the single file I had open, and it's gonna go through and find all the records. So here, let me walk you through what it just did. We had, this is kind of a sample of the data. Here I've got 266,000 rows. Uh, let's limit it to just the names and the unique ones. So we've got 25,380 names. And then down here at the bottom, I've got the random name, Ty Novi. So I, there we go, we have a little Ty Novi here. So what if I didn't wanna do Spark? You know, you're looking at this and you're saying, that's great, we're back to notebooks being for someone other than me, right? That's where our job comes in to try to smooth this over. So we've got in uh, SQL 2019 the ability for you to create external tables. And in the case of the big data clusters, you can create those external tables over CSV files in HDFS. So if I create an external table from CSV and HDFS, let me make this a little bit smaller so you can see what we're doing. Uh, I've got, let's say I'm gonna put it in license data, I'm gonna use a storage pool, use this, and then 
here's that data set, and we used uh, something called PROSE, uh, which is a Microsoft research thing that can identify what the likely data types and file format are. So I'll go here, and I'm gonna take a look, see if it looks right. So in this case, it's saying owner zip, it looks like a small ant. It's like, I know it's a zip code, so actually I'm gonna change that to a char 10. And then I go ahead and hit next and recreate it. But like any good cooking show, of course, I've already done this. So let me go over and show you uh, what that looks like. So what that does is it runs this, uh, you know, very beautiful uh, uh, SQL for you whenever you run that wizard. And then I'm going to run these cells. So I am now connecting to that same CSV data from SQL Server using the SQL language. So here I'm doing a select top 10 star. I'm going to count, I'm going to follow the same uh, flow that I did on the other one. I did a count star, so I have 266,000 rows. Again, I have 20, oh, I scrolled too far. 20, I guess I didn't get the distinct ones. Oh, I didn't show the distinct because I made a CTE. So I've got the distinct names in here, and then I have the name Soul. So here with um, big data clusters and with notebooks, I'm able to move <coughs> very smoothly from SQL and Spark and Python all within the same editor and have that same experience. Now just to show you that I'm not like pre-cooking this data, I want to upload additional data. So let me say upload files. And I'm gonna go to my license data. I'm gonna add a couple more years of data here. And now let's just run that. And so you can see down here it says uploading files to HDFS. Let's make that bigger. And all right, so now it's done. I've got those three additional files. So let's take a look here now. So let's run a select count star from dog license. And now we're up to 364,000. So without having any data movement, I'm able to make those queries over data. So if you're using streaming data, something a little bit more real world than naming a dog, this is really important stuff. So with these uh, experiences, um, we decided this is a great experience, but we can go further. So what, what else can we do with this? So some of the other things that we've added is we did add the PowerShell kernel. So that just went uh, GA this week. And so that way you can do your run books. And using PowerShell, maybe you can make something that connects to multiple servers, right? So you can use your, your uh, DBA tools. You can use all of the different scripts that you're familiar with and you can save them. And then with your SQL uh, kernels, We've also added the ability to schedule a notebook. So with the SQL agent, you can run a job schedule that will run a notebook on a regular basis, store it into, an, into a location on your um, SQL server so that you can pull it back up from the results and you can take a look. So let's say you wanted to run this count of databases or do a little uh, backup job or something like that. You could do it in a notebook and then you would get any errors that you had would be in context to that notebook. I see a question here. Oh, we have two, two behind each other. I'll take the back one first. Does that actually schedule, like, create an agent job for you? Or, or... Yes, so it does create an agent job for you. I'm not going to go through this entire demo, probably, but let me, let me see if I can pull up an example of one. Um, do, 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 do. Uh, manage okay, SQL agent. So here I've got this new notebooks here. And so these are my notebook test jobs. And when it, it shows the notebooks that I actually ran uh, as the results, but these are regular agent jobs. If I were to go over to SSMS, I'd see them. When you look at them, they look like PowerShell because that's what we've actually done under the covers. In order to make it work down version, uh, we couldn't go back and say, let's patch all of the different versions of SQL agent to make them aware of notebooks, but they all do support PowerShell. So we are able to run a, note, a SQL notebook from PowerShell in that agent job, and that's what the actual output is. So you had one more question up front. Are you able to parameterize notebooks with widgets yet? Are you able to parameterize a notebooks with widgets yet? So I'd say there's, there's, two quest, there's two things there. There is IPy widget support, which is kind of a general support for plugins in the Jupyter ecosystem. We do not have support for that yet. Parameterization, though, is something that's a little bit more straightforward. It's actually a reasonable segue into what we're doing. So there is a parameterization framework called Papermill that you can use to automate and operationalize your notebooks, and we are using that fairly heavily, and we do encourage people to use that. So let me give you, give you a really solid example of where we're doing that. So when we were playing with this, a lot of the feedback we got in some of our focus groups was that this looks like a great documentation mechanism. It's also a great way of doing demos, just like I was just doing it. You can walk people through things. So let me do, give you an example of 
this. So here I've got this new icon that came up this month called Jupyter Books. And you even hear like, what's a Jupyter Book? So we have a sample Jupyter Book that's also a very useful Jupyter Book built in. So if I go to the command palette, pick Jupyter Books 2019 Guide, this is actually the set of troubleshooting steps that we have within Microsoft to troubleshoot a SQL Server big data cluster. So our support engineers and our internal live site engineers have all of these things that used to live in OneNotes and in SharePoint at Microsoft. Uh, and so we've moved those into notebooks so that now we have the actual troubleshooters that our engineers would use, and here's the steps we would take. So I want you to run SOP 007 first, and then go to 28. You know, it's because you follow the same things that our engineers would do. So let me go down into one of those and show you. Here's the Knox Gateway logs. This is, you know, in Python. And we are using, um, this is actually part of the SQL Server build. So whenever a version of SQL Server gets built internal to Microsoft, we use these uh, paper mills and all of these operationalization frameworks to create the notebooks and then push them out into the tools so that you'll always have the live recent versions. We won't have notebooks and, and troubleshooters that have like DMVs that have changed names and things as has happened sometimes in the past. Go ahead. How about having the notebooks compatible with OneNote? I will tell you that we are having conversations all the way across Microsoft about how all the different parts of Microsoft can, can work with it. And so the Office team is definitely part of that conversation. I don't have anything to share about that yet, but we're, we're definitely all in on that. Now something that we have from this, is so I'm showing you an example Jupyter book, but this is something that you can use as well. So a Jupyter book is really just a, it's an open source concept of kind of a way to structure your data so that it's known what the chapters are, what the headers are, et cetera. And you can create these as extensions. And so if you are an ISV, if you have a large organization, you wanna create a book and say, this is my, my standard troubleshooting book, or this is a lesson, this is my, uh, pre-con, and this is the, the information I want to share. You can put it into a book, and then you can share it out as an extension. So th for those who aren't familiar with it, SQL Sur uh, Azure Data Studio works on this extension framework, where the individual support for different features is something that you can turn on and off or install or upgrade separately. This allows us to get away from the problem that SSMS had, where ev you right-click on it, and you go to tasks, and you get like 80 tasks. And I'm not even kidding. There is just unbelievable number of tasks because everybody needed something, and you couldn't take it away because of the 5% of people who were looking for it. So with this, you can go in and say, if I'm working with Postgres, I'll install Postgres. If I'm not in working with Postgres, I won't install Postgres, and it won't have my Postgres snippets and everything getting in my way. The same thing goes for PowerShell, it goes for uh, Agent. If you are you know, here mostly to do development and you don't even have access to the Agent, why would you have the Agent features installed? So we have the concept of having notebooks as books be an extension concept. So I see a question here. So I'm anonymous with, with Azure Data um, Is it a free download? Okay. <laughs> I should, I should do a little pitch for Azure Data Studio, I think. So Azure Data Studio is a free download. It's, an, it's a client tool that you can install locally. Second question, does it accommodate all features in SSMS? Like if I see my phones on that dashboard, mm -hmm. if I see my reputation monitor, all, everything that's currently in SSMS, can I see it? And so the other question is, does it have everything, everything from SSMS? And the answer is no. Uh, we are... In some ways, bringing over things from SSMS. In other ways, we're working on kind of new differentiated features like notebooks with the idea that somebody who's working on something that's a little bit more on the um, management config side of things, they'll probably still be an SSMS. Always on is a good example. Whereas the query writing, execution, collaboration type work we see as moving more into Azure Data Studio. Go ahead. Does it require a reboot? Does it require a reboot? No, so it should not require a reboot. You can actually do a user mode uh, install rather than a system level install. Is it compatible with all versions of SQL Server? Is it compatible with all versions of SQL Server? So it is, it's compatible with all supported versions of SQL Server. We don't block any version, but you know, if you were to point it at 2005, we haven't pointed at 2005, so we wouldn't be able to tell you that we would have identified any bugs, but there's nothing that's saying you can't connect to it. It also supports all additions and it supports all uh, distribution uh, you know, installation mechanisms. So we have like nine different ways to install SQL Server on containers, on Linux, on Windows, on Azure, hybrid, uh, Edge, and you can connect to all of those. So I see a lot of questions and I actually want to be sure that I get through a little bit more content real quick so that I give a chance for her. So, we will come back to some questions in a few minutes, and I'm gonna move on to just a couple more things, but I'm, I'm very excited for seeing all the questions. So, 
The last thing that we decided to do, I'd say last, the most recent additional thing we decided to do was to use this power of notebooks um, in, in co combination with our own UI. So whenever I, we have a new feature here where you can do deploy of SQL Server. So with SQL Server on Windows, it's pretty straightforward. You just download the MSI and go. With SQL Server container images, you've got a little bit more to it. So I'm gonna pick the SQL Server 2019 here, hit select, and now it's just going to ask me, what do I wanna name that container? So let me say, Vicky Container, uh, Yukon 900. And here we go, now I have a notebook that's been generated that I can now use and run locally to uh, deploy a Docker container with SQL Server, or I could send this to someone else and say, hey, run this on this machine. So this is uh, an example of where we're using uh, containers, or where we're using notebooks as UI. And we've taken that a little bit further as well. We have an example of a wizard. So the SQL Server big data clusters are, were particularly uh, troublesome to install whenever you were having to do a lot of this stuff manually. I don't know if, uh, how many of you had done so, but you have a number of required tools and you have a number of uh, concepts. So here I'm going to do a deployment of SQL Server big data cluster to an new instance of Azure Kubernetes service. So it's, I need to create a Kubernetes cluster and onto it I want to deploy a SQL Server big data cluster. This is something that, again, I said, it is not your job to be worrying about that, it's your job to be using the platform. So here I've got two options. I have dev test, dev test with HA, I'm gonna pick dev test. And then I can say, I'm gonna use my default subscription, I'm lo logged into Azure already. Uh, here's the resource new group name, et cetera, hit next. And again, we've got a lot of different things you could set, but I'm just gonna kind of next, next through this. And here I have now script to notebook. So now I've, again, scripted this to notebook, and I've got everything I need to do to install my SQL Server big data cluster, and I can run this here, or I can, again, send it to someone else or set it up on a job to run it. So this is kind of the future of the generate scripts options and the generate PowerShell options, because we can still go to PowerShell, but now it'll be PowerShell with documentation in line. It can be something that when you run it and you run a bunch of steps in a row, if you get an error, the error is also saved with the outputs in context to where it happened so that you can send it to someone else for troubleshooting. So we're really excited about that. So let me take a look at my time here. And I actually think I do have a little bit of time. So I wanna show you, have, has anybody here seen my prose demo, my, my prose notebook demo? All right, I wanna show you this because this is kind of a crowd pleaser and it's also kind of in this theme of notebooks. So as you're looking at uh, doing data wrangling in a SQL Server and really across you know, data in general, you come across a lot of different file formats and earlier I kind of just eluded through this, the whole concept of creating an external table and it identified what the file format was. So let me give you a shot at this. So I've got um, this Pros Code Accelerator package that ships with Azure Data Studio and this is a Microsoft Research package that's allow, that helps you do data wrangling. It creates Python code for you to interpret data that might be in kind of an unstructured or, or badly structured form. So let me give you a good view of this. So this is my artist.txt file. So we see it's got some, some mess to it, right? So it's got uh, about 11 lines of header, and then that header is actually duplicative of, of the top row here. We've got hat delimiters, and it's actually a ragged end. So it's got kind of an inconsistent number of, of columns. So this is the sort of thing that if we were to ask someone to create an ETL process to do, someone who was pretty good at this, it would still probably take them 15, 30 minutes to do. They were a good Python developer, they could figure it out. Maybe if they'd seen it before, but still, it, it's something that takes a minute. So what we do here is I've got this read CSV builder, and I'm just gonna tell it from that CSV builder, read this file and learn it. And now what it's done is it's output the code to read it, and now let me just paste it in here, run that. Now I've created this read file now whenever I say read file, it's directly reading that file with all of the correct uh, headers and it has all the correct um, uh, delineations. Now from this, we've got some additional stuff. So I showed you, now it's identifying where the columns are. Let's work out what the types are. So here we've got this interesting uh, wiki QID and this is an integer that's preceded with a Q. 
So I think that there's rational people could disagree about how you should store this information. So what Prose is going to do is going to try to make a best guess effort at this. So it's going to take this, and what we can see here is it created some regexes, and it's saying I'm going to parse the values formatted like this into ints by removing the queue. So I'm going to save you a little bit of space, not save it as a string. I'm going to try to see if that's what you want. So then I run that. And then what I get is all the data types. So now I've got something where it's able to read the table and it's able to identify the correct data types and it's got all of the coercion logic already built in for that. Now again, if I take a look back at that data, we can see that the artist bio is actually uh, storing more than one type of data in that column. This is something that you often see with user input, right? So we've got the nationality and also sometimes where they were born, sometimes when they were born, sometimes when they died, sometimes other words like estimated, et cetera, are mixed in here. So this is something that winds up getting into the realm of highly complicated to, to parse. So what we'll do here is do this find patterns builder. And so on that column, we're saying go find all of the patterns that, have, that exist in this data set so that I can break them up into the different patterns. And then as a human looking at those patterns, I can give them meaning. So I can go here and I can read that Dutch born Germany, 1897, Italian born Tunis. This is examples of what matches this regex. So given that, I've, uh, oh, sorry, so this is what it generated. I've already copied it down here. So if I run this, what I've decided to do is say from these regexes, I've identified which of the groups means birth country in each of the possible different formats of it. So I'm going to create something to extract the birth country. So now given a string like estimated 1987, it's going to say unknown. In the case that it says American, it will say American. And in the case that it's American born China, it's going to say China. So as I've been able to identify that. So I've got a number of other things that the pros uh, a code accelerator can do. It can read JSON files. It can read fixed width files. But really, part of what I wanted to show here is that given that Python uh, can do some of these things for you, with that Python, then you can move into a SQL world and you can kind of move between them. In some of your non-data science and non-machine learning examples, I think a lot of people see people see notebooks and they think this is for data scientists, this is for people doing machine learning. We have a department for that. But I want to invite you that if that is not the direction that you're going, you can still use Python in your normal data wrangling flows. So I'll take one quick question. So this demo notebook, this is my, I need to put it on the SQL Server samples page, basically. So I will make it available to download. This is my, my own demo, but uh, it is just a demo of uh, open source code that's available for Microsoft. One more. Yes, so uh, these are definitely compatible from Windows to Mac to Linux to containers, and, and all of those things work just fine. So, so I've been talking a lot about notebooks, but this is not the only thing that we're working on right now. And so one of the things that if you've been watching this space for a while, this time last year, one of the most common questions I got at this session was, what are you doing about SSDT? What are you doing about SQL Server projects cross-platform? And so I want to explain that the way I gave that whole list of the things that we work on in the SQL Server tools. And the thing is, moving cross-platform is a matter of building from those lower levels up. So you have to get the drivers set. You have to get the command line set. You have to get the uh, uh, programmability set. So that DAC effects framework that I mentioned earlier, which is used for SQL projects for extract, build, uh, transform, all of those, that needed to be taken cross-platform. And so that's done so in the SQL package.exe. And now that that's available, we're going to be able to start doing more work around cross-platform um, work for SQL project. So with that in mind, I want to uh, bring over Udisha and let her show you a little bit about what we're doing in SQL Server uh, database tool, uh, uh, developer tools, and also some of the things that we're doing for the edge. Thank you, Ricky. So 
So I hope you guys have all already heard about Azure SQL Database Edge, which is uh, basically a SQL instance running on an Edge device. Uh, what that lets you do is store any data generated from this device onto the device itself, and you do not have to push every single piece of information to Azure before actually being able to view it. What's even more interesting is that the SQL instance image comes with an ability to run Azure streaming analysis jobs. So not only you can store the data, you can process any data generated by this device onto the device itself. You can filter the data, run simple set of rules, uh, make some runtime decisions, and then store the results into the SQL, which is also running on the device, which is pretty cool. But as a developer, how do you and I go about creating this solution? So for example, uh, you guys saw in Rohan's keynote, I hope, the clapping sensor. So now what happens is there is a device which is running a clapping sensor, which generates some information around clapping, around claps, the frequency, loudness, so on and so forth. What an Azure streaming analysis job running on the device can do is take that data, massage it, transform it in a way that the SQL will understand, and then store it in SQL. And now, using your favorite tools, you can view that data, query that data, export, import, all of those things without having to push that data anywhere outside the device yet. So to develop this solution, I will show you how we can do that in Visual Studio, and then once it's deployed, how we can connect and view the data as well. So we came up with a new extension called Azure SQL Database Edge, which lets you create a new type of solution. Once you create the solution, you will see these two projects in your solution. The first one is an ASA job project, which lets you define the schema of your job. The second one is our own SQL proj, which lets you define the schema of the SQL database. So uh, diving a little more into the ASA job mm -hmm. project. So the ASA job, just to clarify, this is the thing that actually talk, the sensor talks to, correct? Correct. So in the case of the uh, edge device, you have this off-the-shelf sensor that you put in there, but it doesn't know how to speak sensor. Correct. Or it doesn't know how to speak SQL. SQL yeah. But Azure Streaming Analytics mm -hmm. knows how to read it, correct? Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, yeah, so as you can see here in my clapping uh, job, I can define inputs. In my edge device, it will be an edge hub, mm -hmm. uh, which is storing all the data that is coming from the sensor. So my job knows how to read this data. So in this case, it's JSON, right? Correct, okay. it's in JSON format. Uh, and then you have your output, which in our case is a SQL database, mm -hmm. which will be deployed onto the device. And the third piece of the job is the actual query or the code behind which will transform the data mm -hmm. from, the, uh, from the input format into the format that SQL understands. So I see you have like frequency, loudness. So that's like if I'm clapping on the sensor, I guess it's just storing no, Correct. Like it is just storing the basic information of claps and its its own loudness, but we can aggregate aggregate that data, uh, make it a five second interval or something like that. So we don't have like a row per clap, right? We don't need to have a row per clap. <laughs> okay. Yes. And uh, similarly, in my uh, the uh, SQL project, I have a table defined which dis uh, determines what all information I want to store in my SQL. Uh, as you can see, uh, there is also a sample input. So what this project lets me do is, it lets me validate the solution, this job and the database together before actually having to deploy it on the device. Mm -hmm. So if there is a mismatch in schema, some column doesn't allow a particular kind of data, I know that information beforehand mm -hmm. rather than after deploying it onto the device and failing at runtime. So if I choose my projects and I do validate and there is a mismatch, I just did it. So I get an error like that. For example, column so and so doesn't allow nulls, but looks like my sample input contains some nulls mm. uh, uh, values for that particular column. So I make these kind of fixes, I revalidate, I get more confident around the fact that my job will actually be able to input data into SQL. So every time I'm validating, it's taking my sample input, transforming it to, into an output, and then trying to insert that data into my SQL schema, and then failing and passing based on that. Once I'm fully confident, 
I can just go and publish the solution to my choice of subscription. I can update or recreate a job, and so on and so forth. So once I do that, I'll not make you wait through the whole deployment process. Once I have both these packages published onto Azure, I can just deploy them onto my Edge device. So I'll pop over to ADS, where I'm actually connected to the SQL server running on this device. So you can see it already has a clapping DB. Let me get a little bigger, Control Plus. Sure. Yeah, is it better? Okay, so, uh, so you can see that it, the job is already running and it is already pushing data into the SQL server that is running on my Edge device. Not only doing the query, I can also do any kind of development tasks that I am used to do with my SQL projects. So I can actually extract the data out of this. I can uh, extract the schema out of it, extract the data out of it, do incremental deploy of the schema into this database, and do a fresh deployment with data plus uh, schema onto this database as well. So for example, just to run an end-to-end -end scenario, I want to, say, extract the schema out of this particular uh, database. I can just click some buttons, and I will get my extracted uh, DAC pack the way I'm always used to uh, getting. Not only uh, extract and uh, deploy and those sorts, but you can also compare the schema of a database running on this Edge device against any other database, against any other DAC pack that you have, and deploy any kind of changes based on this uh, schema differences to this Edge device. So I can generate script, I, I can apply the changes. I just want to note a little bit here that it's not something that is only for Edge device. You can run schema compare or extract deploy onto any two SQL databases running on any of these platforms. We have to use the uh, UI to do this? Oh, no. So actually, uh, you can do any of these operations just by using the command line with the terminal. So you can do all of these extract, deploy, uh, multiple uh, customized deploys using just the command line. Mm -hmm. Just to show a little bit here, uh, we also have a lot of customization options for, for our deployment. What do you want to do if there are blocking assemblies? What do you want to do if there's possibility of data loss and so on? If you do not want to deploy some specific kind of objects and so on, you can make that decision and your further compares and your deployments will follow that. Mm -hmm. Uh, many a times it happens that we do these kind of deployments, say, bi-weekly or to, to, from my uh, dev database to my prod database and so on. And in that case, you can just save this file, say, and then if you open a fresh schema compare and just open this SEMP file, it will remember all of the changes that you made, including your source, target, any options that you selected or unchecked, or any other inclusion, exclusion uh, that, you, that you made. So basically, all of these things you can do both through GUI as well as through command line, mm -hmm. and both of these things are completely cross-plat, so you can do this on Linux, Windows, Mac, everywhere. But this, this SEMP file is also available for Visual Studio, right? Oh, yes, and it is fully backwards compatible, so if you have saved settings from a pre previous comparison or a pre previous deployment in SSDT, mm -hmm. you can still open that file as it is in ADS or vice versa. So if you create this file in ADS and I see question. Well, and, and it will take it to the next level in creating EDL, or EDL scripts so that you can make Yes, it so you can generate scripts and probably I have some generated scripts as well. So you can generate scripts of this sort just by clicking the generate script here, or you can directly apply it if you want, and it will apply without even generating script. But you can generate script and share and, uh, you know. And code review, check for And yeah, yeah. code review as well, <laughs> yes. Does it do all of it in a single transaction? I think that that's up to you. So right? that's, yeah, so basically uh, the, uh, the query generation, uh, sorry, the script generation is such, and you can decide if you want to modify the script further to do some other things as well. All right, let's 
I've got a lot of questions. So, so the ADS compare is database to database or data to database, right? Correct. I'm still doing my local code to database. I'm still doing that compare in. So for, for projects, uh, let Wiki <laughs> talk about the projects. But yes, today we have brought, we do not have the project system in ADS. Is that a so, goal? yes, I, you know the difference between a good question and a great question. A good question, I have an answer to. A great question to is what I was planning on talking about next. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. So well, I think we saw another question over here. Yeah. Is it similar to a? OPC server? I do not know the yeah, answer I to that. I do not know the answer to it, but so it is a full-fledged SQL server uh, right. running on a device. Uh, so the sensor is basically any off-the-shelf sensor uh, that you can install on the device. It can be a, for your sec for security. It can be a camera. It can be a clapping sensor, the example that Rohan had. And then this data can get transformed through uh, a, an edge job and then gets uh, insert it into the SQL Server running on the device, and then you can do anything with that data that you can do with a normal SQL Server. I'll, I'll admit I'm not an expert on kind of the, the details of it, but we do have a session on Azure SQL Database Edge tomorrow mm -hmm. morning, I think at the 945 slot, uh, by Amit. So uh, that, that should be a really good one if this, this is an interesting thing to you. Here. Yes, so this is a good question about uh, notebook uh, parameterization. And so I showed kind of examples of where we had used parameterization, but what I didn't show is how you parameterize. So I, in that, that respect, I didn't answer. So this concept of paper mill and some other frameworks, what they have is something like the first cell, you define parameters of a given set, uh, you know, format, and then you reuse those in there. And then when you call it from the command line, you would do replaces. You can also do things like some of what we've done is actually, it's, an IPYMB file is fundamentally a JSON file, and so you could do direct JSON manipulation if that was your cup of tea, uh, and say, you know, I actually want to insert these cells uh, in this order. There's also something called Pandoc, which allows you to take uh, something like from Markdown, convert it to docs, convert it to IPYMB. Uh, and so there's a lot of open source uh, IP around this concept of operationalizing notebooks. Uh, Netflix actually uses notebooks extremely heavily, and they're a big committer in the Jupyter space. And they use, uh, they're actually the ones who created Interact and the paper mail that I mentioned. And so they're a really great thought leader to follow in terms of how, how to use notebooks kind of at enterprise you know, scale. OK, yes. So, so the question is, can we convert something into a notebook? We have been playing with that. So the Python team for VS Code has something to convert a Python script into a notebook. So we've been playing with that a lot. If you've got a lot of questions and feedback on that, today at 145, down in, I think, 202, we're doing a focus group on notebooks. And so we're going to have our UX team. We're going to have a lot of our engineers there uh, for us to get this feedback. Because last year, at that focus group, that's when we found out about the schedule notebook. That's when we found out about doing PowerShell. That's when we actually got the feedback about uh, getting the T-SQL kernel. So now that we've kind of delivered all of those things and we know about multi-kernel, we're going to move on to the next ones. I'll say one last question, and then I'm going to go to, to the question that I promised to show a demo. So the question is, how do I know if somebody has tampered with my JSON or with the IPYMB file? That's a really good question because really uh, we haven't got a lot of art around that right now. We have been talking about adding some uh, pipelining around, you know, basically some ACLs, maybe cell level ACLs uh, on on the data, tamper resistance, you know, things like that. And but fundamentally, right now, it would be because you had it in source control and you were sending the source control and you'd be pulling it down and kind of relying on that. So there isn't what I'd call a robust mechanism for using notebooks as like a 
high trust uh, form of like sending PII around. Uh, I would treat it more like uh, an evolution over sending CSV files around and query results. But I, at the current state of the art, I think I would be a little bit more hesitant about wildly emailing around uh, sensitive data in something uh, that's kind of a, a fast evolving space. So. All right. All right, so now we are moving from the things that are available to the things that are not yet available. So we're moving into the realm of things that are yet to come uh, and truly the, the future of SQL Server tooling. So what I have here is our initial thoughts around what we think database projects are going to look like in uh, Azure Data Studio. So this is, to be clear, an actual mock-up, this is what we use, is something called Figma we use in the UX team in order to identify this. And this is a mock-up we put together for a focus group we're doing on Friday, and the focus group is called Collaboration in Data Studio. Uh, and so if you have feedback on this, please come to that session and let us know because we're, we're actively working in this area. So but here we have an example of what we're, for the moment, calling a data space. And I'm going to click on that, and we can see we have SQL database projects in here. And I, they've got the connections listed there. And then I can also you know, go in and see all the schemas. So kind of the, the same sorts of things you would expect in Visual Studio. But I could also go and see uh, some information about like the deployment statuses, maybe recent files. We've got this kind of hand wavy and charts maybe you know, uh, up here. So the thought is that this would become more like an overview of what's going on in your project. Um, so here I could add, uh, say, different tables, connections, things like that. Uh, to my project. So from here, I think, what did we say? Oh, yes, and I would have schema compare as well. Uh, so let's go back here and see what that would look like. So we'd say, I'm gonna add a new, what we're calling a data space, which would be kind of a grouping of multiple projects. And let's say I'm gonna do it from a GitHub repo and hide that, create, and there it is down there. So I'm going to say I'm going to add to that either a blank project. I'll do one based on a folder. I can do one based on a GitHub repo. I can add a SQL database, et cetera. And then once I add that, I've got my project. So this is kind of the direction of what we're seeing uh, projecting looking like in Azure Data Studio. But as you can see, mostly we're talking about how we may need to make it look because the fundamentals of having it work cross-platform through SQL package and DACFX is actually now complete. So we're working through ways to make the SQL projecting system work better in a cross-platform tool, work better for collaboration, work better for kind of modern development frameworks. Um, but the fundamentals of doing extract, transform, compare to source, et cetera, uh, we expect to maintain the same. So that's uh, the first of my brand new things that I was going to show you. Uh, let's see, what, was, what did I have up next? So the next one I've actually been teasing along the whole time and, and haven't uh, answered. Oh, I had a question here on that. Is the thought then in ADS that like a build, like, like to compile to get dead text, is that a more lightweight build now than universal? Because you, you do a large model in Visual Studio and that gets a lot. Yeah, do you have any thoughts on that? So we will, we will have the ability to um, make uh, DAC packs out of the schema files whether it will be through the build tasks or some other way, that we are still uh, noodling over. One of the interesting bits is as we've taken cross-platform DACFX to the SQL package, it's actually, Much what, faster. what did they say, 10 times time. faster now that it's been brought over cross-plat? And I think that's even faster on Windows, correct? Yeah. So it's, it's faster across the board just from the process of, of going in there and doing that deep work. Uh -huh. So that would be faster for like if you're using SQL package, which is the command line tool, because it's used, basically it's the process of moving to .NET Core from .NET Full. We got that 10x uh, improvement in speed. So that's actually available, uh, SQL package 18.4 released this week. So that's available for everybody right now. So one of the things I've been kind of teasing along the whole time that you may or may not have seen is, so we've had Postgres support in Azure Data Studio for uh, since last March. So you're able to, 
use Postgres, you're able to query Postgres, that's on-prem, that's in Azure, and you can actually use your SQL notebooks against Postgres. But what I've got upcoming here is actually MySQL and MariaDB support. So this isn't out yet, but it's coming soon, and it's really helping us to fulfill that promise of being a multi-RDBMS tool as well as a multi-platform tool. So you'll be able to work with your SQL server in all of its different flavors and forms, as well as Postgres, MySQL, MariaDB, and really more to come. We have a lot of different data offerings at, at Microsoft, and the process of adding them to the tool isn't as great with each additional one because we've been learning lessons, but they are coming along, and so as you have requests for them, you know, maybe you want to see Cosmos DB, maybe you want to see uh, the, the MDX, et cetera, just let us know, upvote those things on GitHub. So, um, with that, I think I will move quietly over into my demo here, which is, so this is more or less the same demo I was just giving you. You already gave this yes, demo. Yes, I gave this demo. However, um, what's a little different about this one is this is actually running in a web browser. So uh, I'm very happy to be showing today the first public view of Azure Data Studio web mode. So this is a mode where you can actually run uh, Azure Data Studio not installed on your client. We have a lot of plans around this, especially with our hybrid tooling strategy. So we're really looking forward to that. But here I can see you can go ahead and take a look at that same HDFS data against that same big data cluster that I was looking at earlier, but I'm doing so from within my Chrome browser here. So that's up and coming as well. Go ahead. This is not, it, it, is, it is running, uh, it's, a, it's the whole product running itself. I can't actually go into the details of how we were doing it uh, yet, but uh, I can tell you that it, it, it is a standalone uh, uh, installation. And then, uh, so next up, you know, finally, I, what I wanted to show is a lot of the way through this, I've been talking to you about how we want to hear back from you, we want to uh, have you be involved, et cetera. So what does that look like exactly? Um, so today I published a blog on State of the SQL Server Tools. This is available on Cloud Blogs. And this has kind of gone over uh, broadly some of these things that I've talked about, what we cover, what areas we're working on, and then just this idea of since SQL 2017, what exactly have we been up to? Because this is our little 2019 checkpoint. And so it has a lot of links to the tools and concepts that we've talked about here today. But one of the best places that you can get involved, especially all these questions about how notebooks work, how I could use it, how I want to use it, et cetera, is to go talk to us on GitHub. So you saw my long list at the beginning there of all the commits that we've done. So we work in the open in Azure Data Studio. We work uh, open source, and we have uh, our issue list here. And our issue list here is a combination of bugs and of feature requests and enhancement requests. And we do actually take, you know, we have somebody who's on their sort of the on-call rotation to go through, read these, assign them to the right people to get triaged. You can see when your issue is getting triaged, when we're expecting to work on it, whether we need a repro, et cetera. So how do you open a bug? So let me go over here and show you uh, how you would open a bug. So you kind of hit this little smiley face down here, and you can hit submit a bug. And then here I can say, hey, it's an Azure Data Studio test bug. Testing, and then down here it has this information about do you want to include your system information and enabled extensions? Hit preview on GitHub, and now it's already put this in here. So let's say I wanted to take a little screenshot, I'll just use the snippet tool and go over here and take a little screenshot here, copy that. And right here in GitHub, you can just paste that in there, hit preview, and there it is. So now all I have to do is enter whatever content that I want to share with a dev team, hit submit, and somebody's going to get back to you, you know, pretty much within a business day or two uh, to find out more about that. Also in here, you can take a look at what our existing features are. So I'm pretty sure if I do MDX, uh, I would see add analysis services report support, so I'll go in here, and we can see right now what is the state of it. So we've got it, it's listed in the backlog uh, milestone, and so we've got a number of people who have given us their, their use cases. But the thing that you do here to really tell us is you hit this plus button. So you hit this smiley face, you hit up plus one, and we're just looking for these, and we rank to see what are the most upvoted features. And we really do this on a monthly basis. This is something that uh, we make kind of what we call semester plans, where we make six-month kind of roadmap plans. 
And then, so that's things like finishing out the web mode that we just showed you and this concepts that we're doing around SQL project support. But for some of these other things, the, the real intake into the top of that funnel is these upvotes. So we take those very seriously. We really uh, look forward to you uh, giving us that feedback. So I think now we have about nine minutes left to take some questions. So please let us, let us have it. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna start, you start, you start. You actually have analysis service support? In? Yes. We. It is, it is still an open issue. So this is still an open issue, and so we're just asking for people to upvote. So for everybody who's leaving, thank you so much for your time. And over here. Being a cross-platform open platform, uh, are we gonna collaborate? So um, for everybody who's leaving, I wanna let you know there's T-shirts over there for everybody who would like a T-shirt. Uh, so miracles could happen. Uh, I don't have any direct plans, uh, but, but we're talking about it. So thank you so much.